Blessings, church family. God is good. I say God is good. And all the time. He is good all the time. Amen and amen. My mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord. And let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. Praise ye the Lord, for he is good. To sing praises unto our God. Our fire of the kingdom. It's such a blessing to have you here serving our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's a blessing to worship with you tonight. I'd like to welcome you in the house of the Lord here at South Tacoma Adventist Fellowship. Welcome our speaker tonight, Elizabeth. Welcome to Washington. And I want to welcome any visitors out here. It's such a blessing to have you here tonight. May the Lord welcome your heart and fill you with his spirit. Blessings tonight. I'd like to ask everyone to please rise as we jo join us as we sing tonight before we uh, get into the word of the Lord. Let's use our voices to praise God. And let's just praise Him by using our voices tonight. Thank you, Lord.
people say. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Good evening, everyone. It's so great to be in the house of the Lord, isn't it? I want to welcome you officially now to our first session of Fire Rekindled. All year long, we have been waiting for this moment, and finally, it's here. And guess what, friends? Our guest speaker for this weekend is already in the house. And we praise God for um, the opportunity that we have and the blessing that we have to have her here with us. It's only, it only took about five or six years for us to be able to have her here and so we we bless we bless the name of, of our lord for the, for for the blessing to have you here doctor thank you thank you very much for for being with us here um i want to i want to tell you a little bit about dr elizabeth but before that um i want to invite you just to join me as we pray and ask the lord's blessing let's pray together father in heaven we have come to this place because we want to meet you. And so, Father, we pray that as, as we hear the, the words of life, may our hearts burst to joy so that we will simply know that we, we have come to this place to encounter the, the only living God. Father, we want to pray for uh, your servant, your chose her to, to be here in this place. And we pray that in the same way that you, you chose her, you will also anoint her tonight, not only for tonight, but also for the whole weekend that she's going to spend with us. Father, thank you again for the blessing to have her with us. And we pray, Lord, that we will not hear her from this moment on, that we may hear your voice through her. Father, please reveal yourself to us. May we go home tonight um, revived and simply... Um, knowing that, that this, this is the place where we need to be next to you, Lord. Thank you again for Fire Rekindled, uh, which gives us the opportunity to come together and learn more about you, Father. We want to also pray not only for those of us who are here in this place, we also pray for those that are online. We ask you, Lord, to reach out to them, to send your Holy Spirit, speak to them, heal them, bless them. And Father, we desire that for us as well. Please, Lord, show us your son this morning, this evening. We pray your blessing upon not only this weekend, but upon our program that we are dedicating to, dedicated tonight. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Dr. Elizabeth Talbot is the speaker director for the Jesus 101 Biblical Institute, a media ministry of the North American Division of SDA, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, designed to offer in depth, uh, in depth, Christ centered biblical studies resources. Elizabeth is regularly featured, featured in TV channels, radio stations, and social media, uh, all these venues around the world. Elizabeth has authored several books, including the 2020 NAD Adult Devotional Jesus Wins. The Jesus 101 website. And you can go and check it out at www.jesus101.tv. And smartphone application, Jesus 101, is the name of the application. You can look it up as well. Offer many Bible study resources, including daily devotionals, biblical studies, videos, podcasts, audiobooks, and more. And we have more to share about who uh, Elizabeth Talbot is. But for now, we will leave it there. You have to come back tomorrow so you can hear more about who she is. But the most important thing is that she loves the Lord and that in Him is the one that he, she has come to share during this weekend. So may the Lord bless us and may He speak to us this, this weekend. God bless you, friends. And welcome, everyone. This time we're going to sing our theme song. I'd like to invite you one more time to please stand with us and we sing our theme song. I know this is the first time we, we, we introduce this song. Lord, I need you. Please join us.
Apocalypse, Armageddon, and nuclear war. For many, it strikes fear into their very souls. But the end of this world as we know it, the second coming of Jesus, is not something that we need to fear, but rather something that we should eagerly anticipate. Yes, God will destroy evil once and for all, but for those who have put their trust in Jesus, it will be the greatest reunion of all time. Not only will we be reunited with loved ones that we have lost along the way, but we will also be reunited with God himself, our Father. It is the culmination of God's plan to save his own. For the enemy of God to deceive God's children, enticing them to leave their heavenly Father. They didn't realize that they were being kidnapped by the evil one. And they found themselves in a very dark and lonely place, filled with suffering and pain. Yet, our Father would not give up on us. Yes, Jesus died in our place for our sins, so that we could live with Him forever. God is a faithful Father, and we can count on Him who promised to come back for His children. Jesus Himself told us that He is going to prepare a place for us. Jesus said to his disciples, don't be worried. Have faith in God and have faith in me. There are many rooms in my father's house. I wouldn't tell you this unless it was true. I am going there to prepare a place for each of you. After I have done this, I will come back and take you with me. Then we will be together. This will be the most joyous day that we have ever known. We will be with God for eternity. The Bible tells us that believers in Christ will not be judged by their own works, but Jesus himself will stand in our place. God loves us so much that he sent his one and only son to live a perfect life and die in our place so that we might be saved through him. He was raised back to life, ascended to heaven, and it's preparing a place for us so that we will not be left in a world of sin forever. No, for God himself promised that he will wipe all tears from their eyes and there will be no more death, suffering, crying, or pain. These things of the past are gone forever. God will create a new and perfect earth. Yes, we can look forward to the second coming of Jesus the end of this world with great anticipation. 
Soon, Jesus is coming back for us, his children, and the reunion hug that has been thousands of years in the making will be a reality. No more death, no more tears, no more pain, only love and grace forever and ever. When I was a little girl, my father was a minister, and he used to tell a story that I'm going to start this weekend with. It was a story that as a child always gripped me. The story was a, about a little boy who had a hero, and he always bought all the books that had to do with this hero and magazines and books, always the hero was triumphant, always the hero was winning. Except this last time, he bought a book and his hero wasn't winning. The villain was punching him and kicking him and it seemed like his hero was going to lose this time. And, and he stopped reading in the first chapter, he couldn't take it anymore. And he went to the end of the book. He wanted to know how the story ended. And there in the last page of the book, he found that his hero won. And now, with no fear and no anxiety, he went back to read the rest of the book. Because now he knew how the story ended. And every time that the villain seemed to be winning, he would speak to the villain out loud in the book, and he would say, if you just knew what I know, if you just knew what I know, my hero wins. Well, we know how this story ends, and Jesus wins. The whole Bible may be summarized in two words, simple words, and if this is all you remember of this weekend, it will be enough for your hard days. So we're going to say it together, Jesus wins. Okay, ready? One, two, three. Jesus wins. One more time. Jesus wins. This is our victory cry. We know how the story ends, and Jesus wins. As a matter of fact, he has already won at the cross. And he will come back for us. And we are waiting excitedly. I know many people are afraid. I know many people are anxious. So we're going to start this weekend with some portraits of Jesus in the last book of the Bible. You see, we were given the last book of the Bible so that we would not be afraid. We were given this book Unfortunately, I know, maybe you too have attended some Revelation seminars that filled you with fear, but this book was actually written so that you would not fear. So it was written so you would get portraits of Jesus for times like these. And so I know that this weekend and this whole series of Fire Rekindled has been um, titled Faithful to the End. But this weekend, I want to tell you that he will be faithful to the end. Because our faithfulness is only a response to his faithfulness. I mean, we love him because he first loved us. And we are only faithful if we understand his faithfulness to us. And so this whole weekend, we're going to study quite deeply several aspects of what the cross brings to us for times like these. Tonight we are studying his assurance. And so we're going to see four portraits of Jesus that give us assurance for times like these. And at the end of our time together, we're going to have an experience tonight that if you have never done this before, you will never forget it. It's going to be a worship experience using one of the worship scenes of the book of Revelation. And so all of you need to have a handout that was given to you that is word by word, chapters 4 and 5 of the book of Revelation. We're going to use that at the end. If you don't have it, 
please raise your hand right now. So I have some people here. I don't know where Pastor Rudy is, but we're going to need the, the handouts. We have several people that don't have it, and we need it. So thank you. Keep your hands up because they're bringing them right now. You don't want to miss this part. This is at the end of our worship service today, but I want us to make sure that we all have everything we need for tonight's service. All right. Anybody else missing it? Over here, we need one. Okay, so every time we are together, we're going to actually study the Bible quite deeply. So you're going to need a Bible, whether you have it on your iPhone or your iPad, or you actually have the book like I do. And uh, perhaps bring some pen and paper to make some notes so that you can share that. Put the handout away for now. That's uh, Revelation 4 and 5, word by word. But we're going to do that together at the end. All right. Any more? Everybody has one. Okay. Let's open our Bibles in Revelation chapter 1. Interesting that these portraits of Jesus have been given to us as an antidote to anxiety. Antidote to anxiety. So remember that tonight we are studying why these portraits were given to us for times like these. Not only to rekindle our fire, but to have assurance that he will be here to the very end with us. That at no point are you here alone as if you were an orphan. So we're going to study four of these portraits. And um, this weekend I will offer you a little gift from our ministry that is a booklet uh, called Revelation, the fifth gospel that I wrote on the portraits of Jesus in the book of Revelation. So you will be able to get this book for free this weekend. All right, let's start. Chapter 1, verse 1. Revelation 1, verse 1. This first sentence tells us what's going to happen in this book. The revelation of Jesus Christ... This word revelation is the word apocalypsis in Greek. That's where we get all these words, apocalypse and all of that. But, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's misused by people and by movies and all of that because apocalypsis means unveiling. Apocalypsis, which is translated in English, revelation, is unveiling. It's like if you had a piece of art and it's covered and you take it off, and you go, ta-da! That's the word apocalypsis. It's the revelation in the sense of unveiling, taking, taking a veil off. And for the first time, you see the scope of what Jesus did at the cross. Because on the Gospels, we know he died, we know he was raised from the dead, but in Revelation, we see the cosmic effect of his death. And so that's why... The, the book starts by saying, ta-da, this is the unveiling of Jesus Christ. And that's what the word apocalypsis means, which in Spanish we call the, the book of Revelation apocalypsis because that's the word in Greek. Now, I'm going to show you two things before we get started with the first portrait. This is very, very exciting. Verse 4, chapter 1, verse 4. John to the seven churches that are in Asia. Grace to you and peace. Interesting that it uses these two big words to get started in this book. And you already see that the salutation tells you what this book is going to give you. Grace and peace. Grace and peace. So circle those two words. From him who is and who was and who is to come. Now, the whole book is based on two verbs that are in verse 5. So, this is very important. Underline it, circle it, highlight it. From Jesus Christ, I am in Revelation 1, 5. From Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn or the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, and here we go with the two verbs. To him who, what? Okay, so... The Greek original has it in present tense. To him who loves us and loves us and continues to love us. So you need to know that this verb is in the present continuous tense in Greek. So 
the first thing that he tells us about Jesus is that he loves us and loves us and continues to love us. Very important that you know this because the whole book was given to you so that you don't go through times like these without knowing that Jesus is the one who loves us and loves us and continues to love us. So present, continuous tense. Second verb, and released us, past tense. He freed us, released us from our sins by what? His blood. So this is the foundation of the book of Revelation. Two verbs. Jesus loves us and loves us and continues to love us and has already, 2,000 years ago, past tense, released us, freed us from our sins through his blood. So this is a description of Jesus as we start. And if you remember these two verbs, you will never fear the future. You will never fear the end times. You will never fear the judgment. You will never fear the end of the world because Jesus has two verbs from, for you from the very beginning. He loves us and loves us and continues to love us and has already freed us from our sins by his blood. See, it's very different to read the book of Revelation with what we call a pseudo-gospel that says if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you might be saved. That's not the good news of the Bible. The good news of the Bible is not a possibility of salvation, it's an assurance of salvation. And it's very different. When I'm dying, I don't want the probability of being saved, I want the assurance that I am saved. And the book of Revelation starts by telling you there is, a, there is a present situation and it's that you're being loved by God and loved and loved and you will continue to be loved. But there's also a situation that has already been done and it's that you have been released from your sins by his blood. In the book of Revelation, we spell salvation D-O-N-E, done. And it will be mentioned several times. Now, after we get these two verbs, then we are told, verse 7, Behold, he's coming with the clouds. And I, I think it's not a, a coincidence that we are told he's coming after we were told that he loves us and loves us and continues to love us, and we have been released from our sins by his blood. Now you can expectantly and happily and joyfully know that he's coming with the clouds. And every eye will see him. And then in verse 8, we get the first portrait of the four we're going to see tonight. I, you know, sometimes the Holy Spirit gives, gives me some winks when we start a series. And I got the wink on the first, I got the wink on the first song tonight. I'm the Alpha and the Omega. We sang it. I, I mean, they didn't know I was going to talk about this tonight. And it happens to me very often that, that a song says, yeah, you know, the Holy Spirit is here, and this, he put everything together because they, they didn't know what I was going to talk about. So here's the first, the first portrait of Jesus in the book of Revelation, and you'll see what this means to you. Remember that we're doing four portraits that give us assurance that he's with us to the end. So the first one. I am the Alpha and the Omega. What is Alpha and Omega? Yeah, it's the beginning and the end because it will say that later. But what is Alpha and what is Omega? First and last letters of the Greek alphabet. So Alpha is, is like the A for us. Omega is like the Z for us. So if Jesus were to give us this portrait of himself today for us in this church tonight, what would he say? I am the A and the Z. So this is the first of the portraits we're going to see of Jesus. I am the A and the Z. Now check this out. 
There is no problem that you could have come with tonight that doesn't start with either an A or a Z or any other letter in between. Jesus, the first thing he does at the very beginning of the book, gives you the assurance of his presence from the beginning to the end. He says, I am the A and the Z, and I'm covering the whole alphabet. If you have a D for divorce or a P for pandemic, or any other thing that you came with is going to be included in the ABC because he's telling you, I am over all of it. I'm the A and the Z. There's not going to be one moment, one situation, one circumstance, one day in this whole world that you're going to be without me. And so that's the first portrait you get. I am the A and the Z. Doesn't that fill you with assurance already? And we haven't even started the book. I am the A and the Z, says Jesus. I was there at the beginning. I will be there at the end. There's not going to be any moment that you're going to be without me. And so uh, that's the first portrait. And this is the assurance of his presence at all times in your life. In good times, bad times, mountaintop, valleys, I am the A and the Z, says here, says Jesus. And if you are getting anxious about the future, or maybe you're anxious about the past, or maybe you're anxious about the present, then you get this multi-directional assurance. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is present, who was past, and who is to come future. There's no direction you can look at where Jesus is not there. I'm the one who is and the one who was and the one who is to come. And so he will repeat this. Look at Revelation 1, verse 17. You know, John sees him and he's afraid. And here's where we get this word from Jesus that this book was written so that you may not be afraid so that you would fear not, so that you would get these portraits of Jesus for times like these. Now, when you're in the middle of a pandemic or in the middle of a situation or in the middle of whatever it is that you're in the middle of, Jesus says, look, I'm the A and the Z. I'm the one who was and is and is to come. And so he repeats this in verse 17 and gives those parallel statements that you said a moment ago. Revelation 1, 17. When I saw him, says John, I fell at his feet like a dead man, and he placed his right hand on me, saying, what did he say? Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. And by the way, the right hand is always the strong hand of God in the Bible. He says, he put his right hand on me and said, don't be afraid. Why shouldn't I be afraid when I talk about the end of the world? Why shouldn't I be afraid? Oh, Jesus says, because I am. And I am the first and the last. So here you get the other part that you told me a moment ago. And I want to tell you something for those of you that are taking notes. The word last in Greek is the word eschatos, where we get the word eschatology. Eschatology is the study of the last day events. We call it eschatology. And Jesus says, don't ever talk about eschatology if you're not going to be talking about me. Because then, of course, you're going to be afraid. Because you're going to talk about last day events without me. Then you're going to be afraid. But he says, don't be afraid because I am your eschatology. I'm the first and the last. I am the eschatology, says Jesus. So anytime you're feeling afraid of the end of the world, of the signs, of the judgment, it's because you're studying that without the eschatos. Woohoo! So Jesus says, look, I am the end. <laughs> so you want to talk about the end? Talk about me. Because if you don't talk about me, then you're going to be afraid. And so he says, do not be afraid. I am the first and the eschatos and the living one. And I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys. What kind of keys does he have? Read it. 
Verse 18 at the end. I have the keys of death and of the grave. You know, I lost both of my parents in a very short time. I am an only child, and it was hard. Both of my parents died of, of cancer within a few months from each other. Quite young, both of them. And when I buried my dad, who was my second parent to die, my mom was already buried. So when I went to bury my dad, I asked the cemetery if I could put a key inside their tomb. So I brought a big key. And when I put my dad there, I put the key there. And everybody wanted to know why I was putting a key inside the tomb. I said, well, because Jesus said, I have the keys of death. So I'm going to put a key in here, and the next one that will open this tomb will be Jesus on resurrection morning. And he will find the key, because I believed his promise that he's going to open that tomb and bring them back to life. Oh, says Jesus, this is the beginning of the book. And he says, you know who I am? I'm the A and the Z. I'm the first and the last. I was dead, and now I'm alive, and I have the keys. So the first assurance that you get is the assurance of his presence from the beginning to the very end. So even if you're facing death tonight, you know who has the keys. And he says, I'm the beginning and I'm the end. So you're never going to go through anything without me. All right, second portrait that we're going to see tonight. Revelation chapter 5. Now, this is the part that we're going to do together at the end, but I need to tell you a few things because these are portraits of Jesus. We're not going to do the handout just yet. This is going to be at the end. You know that the book of Revelation is a book of worship. For those of you that are taking notes, there are 16 worship scenes in the book of Revelation. Everybody's worshiping the Lamb who was able to do what nobody else could do. And they don't just worship uh, here or there. The whole cosmos is worshiping Him. So this is the first of the 16 worship scenes, Revelation 4 and 5. Revelation 4 is the worship of the Creator who has created the heavens and the earth. But then chapter 5 starts and there's a problem. There is a scroll. It's the history of the world. And nobody know how the, how, knows how the world ends. Nobody can open this scroll. Nobody can read it. There's no one worthy to open it. And, 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 and John starts weeping because we don't know how the story ends. We want to know how the story ends. And so John starts crying. And I'm going to read it to you so that you can get the second portrait here. Chapter 5, verse 1. I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book written inside and on the back. Actually, the Greek says a scroll because at that time there were no books. A scroll written inside and on the back, sealed up with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to break the seals? And no one, verse 3, no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth, was able to open the book or to look into it. Verse 4, then I began to weep because, see, John in Revelation participates in the visions that he sees. And I began to weep, he says, greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, stop weeping. Behold, the lion. This is the second portrait we're going to see. The lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome as to open the book and its seven seals. And, and John wants to see. He hears that the lion has triumphed. He hears that there's a mighty, victorious lion, the root of David, who has triumphed and can open this, the history of the world. But he only hears that when he turns to see this mighty lion he sees something else. Now, I want to tell you a little bit about this because there's such great confusion about the book of Revelation. 
Now, you must write this down if you want to learn about Revelation. There is a pattern in this book that is called hear, then see. So many times in the book, he hears something, and when he turns to see what he heard, he sees something else that expands what he heard. So many times we have this. In chapter 1, he hears a voice and turns and sees a vision of the Son of Man and the stars and the candles and all of that. This is a very important pattern because in chapter 7, he hears the number of the redeemed. And there are 144,000. But when he turns to see the 144,000, he sees a multitude that no one can count. So it's very important that you know this because first he hears something, then he turns and sees something bigger that expands and clarifies what he has heard. Is that clear? Okay, so here, <clears throat> he hears that the mighty lion of Judah has triumphed. And when he turns to see the mighty lion, he sees something else. Let's read verse 4, 5, and 6. I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah... The root of David has overcome us to open the book and his seven seals. And then he turns, and I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb. <laughs> he heard that it was a lion, but then he sees the lamb. And the lamb is now standing as if, as if slain. So the lamb has been slain, but it's now very much alive because it's now standing. So here I have... The second portrait, the mighty lion is actually a lamb that was slain, but is now very much standing. Now, that was the assurance of God's presence with you. This is the assurance of God's redemption of you. And so everybody starts singing. Now, we're going to do this at the end. It's a fantastic scene. But everybody starts singing a new song that the mighty lion that was actually a lamb that was slain has been able to purchase for God people from this earth. Now, let me tell you this. You probably have heard the statement of righteousness by faith. Righteousness by faith means that you are declared right with God, not by your works, but by grace through faith in the one who did all the work. I'm going to make the definition again, just to make sure. Righteousness by faith means that you are declared right with God, not by your own works, but by grace through faith in the one who did all the work. And so you know and believe that you have been saved by what he has done. And what he has done is he lived a perfect life in your place. He gave that perfect life at the cross in the perfect payment for all your sins. He was raised from the dead. And now every person that believes in him as a savior knows and believes that he has been purchased from the earth for God. So you are no longer afraid of the judgment. Why? Because you were judged here. And so you don't wait in dread for the end of the world. You have been purchased. So not only do you have the assurance of his presence till the end, you have the assurance of your redemption in him. And so let's read it. Everybody starts singing this song when they realize that the mighty lion has triumphed as a lamb that was slain. So verse 9, and well, we're going to do it together at the end. And they sang a new song. Why is it new? Because now the whole universe is saying, what? There's one that is worthy to open this story? Yes, there's only one that is open that is worthy because nobody else could open it because it had to be the mighty lion who triumphed as a lamb that was slain. 
And now he's very much standing because he's no longer dead. Now he's alive. And they sang a new song, verse 9, saying, and this is the context of the song, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were, what? Slain. And did what with that slaining? You purchased for God with your, what? Blood. That was the currency. You purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. I was told by Pastor Rudy that there are many, many nations represented in this church. And I love that. I, I love it when it's a multicultural church because I think it's a little piece of heaven. Because here it says that you purchased with your blood people from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And you have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God and they will reign upon the earth. And then you get this verse 12. Now, now the rest of the people, there are no people, beings, angels, they just can't stand it anymore. They start joining in this song. And so the, the angels join in in verse 12. Worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive, and this is the sevenfold praise. It's a complete praise that we have many times in Revelation. Receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Why is everybody praising the lamb? Oh, because he was able to purchase people from the earth. Okay, so this is the second portrait of Jesus. First is the A and the Z that gives you the assurance of his presence from beginning to end. The second one is the mighty lion that he sees as the lamb that was slain that gives you the assurance of salvation, <laughs> assurance of redemption. If you want to add something to your salvation, you are 2,000 years late. There's nothing you can add to merit your salvation. Because we are not saved by our own works, but by grace through faith in the one who did all the work. So not only do you have the assurance of his presence, you have the assurance of salvation. I'm going to go to the third portrait. There's many, many portraits in the book of Revelation, portraits of Jesus specifically, for times like these. And they're all, they're all portraits that will give you such assurance that when, when you stop reading these portraits, you're like, what was I, I, why was that afraid? Afraid of what? Right? I like that. Right? Many years ago, there was an accident of a cruise ship, the Costa Concordia, in the west coast of Italy. Perhaps you remember. A large cruise ship that went down. There was a story that came out that really touched me. They didn't have enough life jackets for all the the people, and, and many, many people died. And there was a couple there, Francis Cervell and his wife, were celebrating their 40th, 40th anniversary. And they only had one life jacket for the two of them. And Francis was a very accomplished swimmer. And he said to his wife, Swim on, my darling. Take the life jacket and swim on, my darling. I'll catch up. And she never saw him again. And she gave many interviews after that and said, he truly gave my life for me. Every time I hear this, it's like Jesus is telling me, swim on, my, my darling. Here's the life jacket. And he went to the cross and died for me. And this type of love between a husband and, a, and his wife is one of the metaphors that God chooses to use as the way he loves us. 
So the third portrait we're gonna see tonight is the one that he is the bridegroom and we are the bride. But not only is he faithful to come back for us, he even gives us the dress to wear so that we look righteous in his sight. Now, the whole book of Revelation uses this bride, bridegroom. And I don't know, many of you are married. Today I was talking to Pastor Rudy and, and his wife um, because they got married in the Philippines when they were studying many years ago. And my cousin's kids were the ones that walked the aisle for them. And every time I see somebody get married, I, everybody's watching the bride, but I love to watch the groom because the groom has this big smile. You know, we always talk about how anxious we are for Jesus to come back, and we're the bride. Can you imagine how anxious Jesus is to come for us? He, he can't wait to have you in his arms. He, he, he's so faithful that he not only said he's coming back, and he will come back, but he will provide everything for you to be at the wedding including the dress. So during the book, of, uh, uh, in a reading of the book of Revelation, you'll see that those who wash their robes in the blood of the Lamb now are standing in white. But the white wasn't theirs. The, the white was given to them. So look, look at, uh, go to Revelation 19 for the third portrait. Verse 7. Revelation 19, 7. Let us rejoice. <laughs> to tell you the truth, I don't know where we got this idea that we all have to be afraid of the end because the book of Revelation is so excited telling you that the bridegroom is coming. Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride, we are the bride, has made herself ready. And now the next verse, verse 8, many times is misread. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen. It's not in her closet. It's not in her closet. It's given to her to clothe herself in fine linens. And from there on, God sees her as righteous is given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean. And it says, the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. What righteous acts? The one that they were given to wear. And this is the part that we need to understand. That the, the way that you're going to stand in front of God is not with your own righteous acts. That's why we call it righteousness by faith. You are declared right, not by own works but by grace through faith in the one who did all the work that's why the verb is given to her is so important so where do you get the white robes you get them by washing them in the blood of the lamb now this covering is very important in the bible because adam and eve lost their covering in genesis 3 they they were covered by god's righteousness but they chose to leave God's moral principles, moral umbrella. And they lost their covering, and for the first time, they found themselves naked. And what did they try to do? <laughs> they tried to cover it. Like if God wasn't going to notice that they had fig leaves now. And I, I think it's so crazy that we think that way. They, they put all these fig leaves, and, and they think they look good. And God says, I'm going to kill an animal, and I'm going to dress you with skins because that's what it's going to take for you to be back in paradise. So the whole Bible long is a clothing crisis. What are we going to wear? Because the righteous dress is not in our closet. So we get to Laodicea, that is the last church, and, and Laodicea thinks they're well-dressed. They think that they, their good works are so good that God should say, well, thank you so much. You really deserve to be in heaven. 
And, and, and God says, don't you realize you're naked, miserable, wretched? Buy from me the white robes and cover your nakedness. So, oh. so the bridegroom is coming and is given to her to be clothed in fine linen. And then chapter nine, verse, 19, verse 11 is the coming of Christ. And I saw heaven opened. And it's interesting because in this scene, everybody's wearing white. The angels are white. The people are white. The horse is white. But there's one that is wearing something else. Verse 11. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. Verse 13. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood. Because that's the price he had to pay for his bride to go home with him. So the first portrait we saw is the assurance of his presence, A to Z. The second portrait we saw is the assurance of redemption, that you have been saved. The third portrait we see is the portrait of the assurance of his faithfulness that not only does he come back as a faithful husband, but he provides everything you need to be part of that wedding. And the last portrait that we're going to see tonight, before we do our worship scene, is one that I think all of us can relate to. The one metaphor, see, God had to use metaphors to teach us things, because how could we understand who he is and what he has done. And the, bride one, the bridegroom one is, is very nice, but maybe you have an ex, ex-husband or ex-wife, and you're saying, yeah, that's a good metaphor, but mm. So then God said, okay, this is the one that is going to go from Genesis to Revelation. You are my child, and I'm your father. Because no matter what your child does, you're never going to say, there goes my ex-son or there goes my ex-daughter. And so the fourth one is the one that we are going to develop more fully tomorrow in our sermon time at 11 a.m. with much more information than the one I'm going to give you tonight. But God creates us in his image. We are the only part of creation that is in his image. And image is, the, the image is not a weird word. It will be used later in Genesis 5 when Adam has a child in his image. So you know what it's like when they give you your baby the first time and you hold that baby and you make this covenant immediately that no matter what that child needs, you're going to give, even if that's your life. My mother saved me so many times from the pool when I was drowning, from all kinds of things. Why? Because a mother, a father, immediately when he sees that baby, says, this is my child, in my image, I'm going to do whatever is needed to save this child. Well, in Revelation, we have that final hug. You see, in Genesis 3, the kidnapper comes along and kidnaps the children of God and says, oh, your father told you that? No, he's a liar. Come with me. I have better candy. You will know good and evil. You will be in a whole different place. And they follow the kidnapper. And God immediately did what we call the covenant. And unfortunately, our translations are, don't give the passion that is in the Hebrew in Genesis 3, 15 where God says, I will crush your head. Why, will, why would you tell a kidnapper that took your children? <laughs> God says, read my lips. I will crush your head. I will come back for them, and you're not getting away with this. So the whole Bible long, we have a sentence that is a covenantal sentence. I will be their God, and they will be my people. I will be their God, and they will be my people. And at the end of Revelation, God says, finally, I'm with them 
and they're with me. And whoever believes in me to the end will be my child. So let's read it. This is the assurance of his love until the end. So this is Revelation 21. This is the last one we're going to see today. Tomorrow we're going to see many, many more things. Revelation 21, I'm going to start reading on verse 3. This is the famous part of this, but I'm going to read all the way to verse 7, where God says, finally, I'm with my children, and you will be my son. So let's read it. Verse 3, Revelation 21, 3. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. This is the sentence that has been repeated from Genesis all the way to Revelation. I will be their God. They will be my people. Well, finally, he's with them. He's with us, and we're with him. Verse 4. All the consequences of sin of Genesis 3 now are taken away. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there will be no longer any death, no longer any mourning or crying or pain. And you can add your list. No more divorces, no more abortions, no, no more jail, no more drugs, no more pandemics, no more. The first things have passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I'm making all things new. And he said, Write, for these words are faithful and true. And then he said, This is how we spell salvation. It is done. D O N E. It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega again, <laughs> the beginning and the end. And I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. And he who overcomes, which by the way, in Revelation, overcoming means believing in the Lamb until the end. Overcoming doesn't mean, ooh, do I have a lot of strength and muscle? Do, can I be faithful to the end? That's not what it means. Overcome means you believe in the Lamb until the end. He who overcomes, verse 7, will inherit these things, and here we go, and I will be his God and he will be my son. This is the assurance of God's love as our father to the very end. So these four portraits, they're simple, they're profound. So let's do it. Let's go over it. The first one, the assurance of his presence, A to C, beginning to end. The assurance of redemption, the mighty lion that became the lamb that was slain. The assurance of his faithfulness, that he's coming back, and he also gives us what to wear to the wedding. And the assurance of his love as a father who never gave up on his children. Doesn't this fill you with assurance? He who loves us and loves us and continues to love us and at the cross released us from our sins by his blood. He's the one that is coming in the clouds and we're waiting for him. So tonight, I would like us to have an experience of what it will be like to worship the Lamb in heaven for eternity. This is going to be an experience that if you have never done this, will be very special because we're going to use the Bible word by word. We're not going to add anything to the Bible. But because these worship scenes are so majestic and there's so many voices that come in, today you will experience it like that because we will do it together here. And I'm going to, we're going to prepare this together now. Uh, and then I'm going to pray that we'll, God will sanctify our imaginations so that he transports us to heaven in our minds. Because I really hope we're going to be there very soon. So take your hand out. Anybody missing your hand out? Okay. So 
Once we start, we're not gonna, uh, we're not gonna stop. So I just wanna make sure everybody's clear. I need one person that will be the voice in the second line that says voice. It has to be very loud, you have to stand up, and it has to say, come up here, I will show you what must take place. Who wants to be that voice? Okay, could you, could you stand, please? I need four people to be the four living creatures, and you have to come up here to this mic. Four people. Please come, one at a time. Thank you. Oh, you're going to the bathroom. Well, I need a creatures. Okay. Okay, we have four. You are not all going to the bathroom, right? Okay. Okay. So, so is this is this uh, mic working? Yeah. No. There. Okay. So you guys are gonna be looking that way, and you need to be quite coordinated so that when the four living creatures are talking, you all do it like, you know, holy, 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 you know. Are you the fourth creature? Yes. All right, very good. I need this group from here, here is gonna be group one. You are the 24 elders. And all of you have to read because it has to sound like the 24 elders over here, okay? I need one person to be the strong angel who wants to be and also very loud from where you are that says, who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals? You want to be that? Okay, could you stand, please? So the first one is the voice. You are the strong angel with all your might, okay? I need one elder at the bottom of the first page. Who wants to be the one elder? Hello, 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 one elder. Okay, Pastor Rudy? Yeah. Elder doesn't mean old. Maybe that's why you guys didn't want to do it. <laughs> okay, turn the page to the other side. This is four living creatures and 24 elders. You guys know who you are over here? You're the 24 elders. You're the group one, okay? So at that point, it's four living creatures and the 24 elders. All of you on this side, you are group two, you are the angels. All of you on this side are the angels. Okay, are we clear? Where it says everyone, who is it? Okay, so if it says everyone, you do it. Don't leave some people doing it by themselves. And four living creatures, don't forget the amen towards the end. All together. Any questions before we get started? No questions? This is a fantastic experience. So, the voice, raise your hand, the voice. Four living creatures, raise your hand. Group one, raise your hand. Hey, it's all of you, here, all the way over there. Who is the strong agent? Raise your hand. Who is the one elder? <laughs> Who are the four living creatures and the group one? Who are the angels? Okay, don't forget, because it has to sound really... See, this scene keeps adding voices, and then all of a sudden, we're all, everyone is doing it. And four living creatures, amen at the end. Who is everyone? Okay, so I'm going to pray that the Holy Spirit will sanctify our imaginations, and that you may start, may start tasting what it will be like to be in heaven worshiping the Lamb. So I'm going to pray, and then we'll start. And obviously, I'm the narrator. I think you figured that part already. Dear Father, dear Jesus, dear Holy Spirit, thank you for giving us portraits of Jesus for times like these. Thank you because we know how the story ends and Jesus wins. 
And tonight, as we read your word, word by word, we ask you to sanctify our imaginations, that we may experience what John experienced, being there, participating, realize that there's one who is worthy of all praise, who can open the seals, who can read the book, who can tell us how the story ends, and Jesus wins. We want to live this life knowing the last chapter. We want to live this life without fear and without anxiety because we have the assurance of your presence, the assurance of salvation, the assurance of your faithfulness, and the assurance of your love. So as we read chapters 4 and 5 of Revelation, may the Holy Spirit fall on us that we may have the experience of what it will be like, even a little glimpse of what it will be like to praise the Lamb for eternity. We ask in the name of the Lamb, Jesus Christ, amen. amen. After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I had heard, like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after these things. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, the throne was standing in heaven, and one sitting on the throne, and he was sitting, was like a jasper stone, and a sardius in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne, like an emerald in appearance. Around the throne were 24 thrones. And upon the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothing white garments and golden crowns on their heads. Out from the throne come flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was something like a sea of glass, like crystal. And in the center and around the throne, four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first creature was like a lion, and the second creature was like a calf. And the third creature had a face like that of a man. And the fourth creature was like a flying eagle. And the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, are full of eyes around and within. And day and night, they do not cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. And when the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and ever and will cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and because of your will they existed and were created. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book written inside and on the back, sealed up with seven seals, and I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Strong angel. And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the book or to look into it. Then I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book in its seven seals. And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne where he had taken the book. 
the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each one holding a harp and golden balls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the book to break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom of priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, and the living creatures, and the elders, and the number of them was myriads of myriads, and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, And every created thing which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them, I heard saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures kept saying, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. O oh Lord. We can't wait for that day when we will join everyone that is in heaven and the whole universe to praise you because you left heaven for us and you refused to go through eternity without us. And Lord, if there's anyone here tonight that has never given their life to Jesus, I ask that tonight may be that night when they surrender their life to you because they want to be there with the rest of us. Thank you for Jesus who loves us and loves us and loves us and will continue to love us. Thank you because he already released us from the penalty of our sins at the cross. And thank you because right now, and until the end, we can live with the assurance of your presence, the assurance of redemption, the assurance of your faithfulness, and the assurance of your love. We love you so much, and we can't wait to see you coming in the clouds. May it happen soon and very soon. We ask you in the name who is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. In the name of him who was dead but is now alive and has the keys of death. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. See you tomorrow. 10 a.m., then 11 a.m., then 2.30 p.m. God bless you. Mm-hmm.